able to build your kingdom. It's in your precious name we pray. Amen. Yeah, all God's people said, amen. Well, good morning officially, Trinity family. Welcome to those of you who might be joining us for the first time this morning. We are glad that you are here as we are beginning this morning a two-part uh, series uh, looking at one of the more puzzling stories of the Bible, a story about a guy who is judged guilty by God for doing something he sincerely believed was good. Uh, let me just say this about this story that we're going to be looking at. It really is a cautionary tale to our culture that has bought into the lie that if we sincerely believe something to be good, then it is. When the truth is, just because we sincerely believe something to be good does not actually make it good. No, in fact, defining whether something is good is up to God and specifically up to his word, which is why anything that does not align with God is not good no matter how sincerely we believe it to be so. By the way, how many of you have ever done something that you believe to be good and yet despite your sincerity, doing that thing blew up in your face because you found out afterward it wasn't good? Yeah, a few honest people in the room. Okay, well, for those of you who are honest, you're in good company this morning because King David, uh, the king of Israel some 3,000 years ago or so, was arguably the most sincere follower of God that ever walked the face of the earth. David was referred to as a man after God's own heart. He was a sincere follower of God. And yet, there was an episode in David's story, the one we're going to be looking at this morning, when David was sincerely doing something that he thought was good, that was not good, and it resulted in a guy losing his life. And of course, as you can imagine, David became very discouraged. David became very confused by this because of how sincerely he believed that what he was doing was good. Now, fortunately, as you're going to see over the next couple of weeks, David doesn't get stuck holding on to his sincerity like some religious badge. No, as you're going to see, David humbles himself and goes back to God's word and makes the necessary course corrections to get back into alignment with God's ways. So if you have a Bible, I invite you to turn with me uh, to 2 Samuel 6. If you don't have a Bible, the words from this scripture will be up on screen. Uh, as you're turning to 2 Samuel 6, to what I said is a very obscure passage of the Bible, uh, as you're turning there, let me set up this story that we're going to be looking at this morning and next Sunday. Uh, David, the king of Israel has just led Israel into victory over the Philistines, the enemies of God's people. And David is now making plans to bring the recaptured Ark of the Covenant back to Jerusalem, back to the religious and political capital of the land. Now, when you think about the Ark of the Covenant, uh, I don't want you to think about the Ark like it's some trophy between rival college football teams, right? Where it's like, hey, now we won and we're getting it back. You know how that sometimes goes? Like the jeweled Shalala. How many of you know what the jeweled... Shalala is? Oh, Notre Dame fans in the house. You raise your hand so quickly when I ask that question. <laughs> Unbelievable. Well, the Ark is not like that trophy that sometimes gets passed back and forth between rival football teams. No, the Ark of the Covenant was the symbol of God's presence. The ark was the sign that God dwelled with his people, that he dwelled with Israel. And so what David is seeking to do in bringing the ark of the covenant back to Jerusalem is a really important thing. Right? This is a really important thing, and it's a reflection of his devotion to God. So let's pick up the story in verse 1 of chapter 6. It begins this way. David, again, brought together all the able young men of Israel, 30,000. He and all his men went to Bala and Judah to bring up from there the ark of God, which is called by the name, the name of the Lord Almighty, who is enthroned between the cherubim on the ark. So I want you to get this scene in your mind. 30,000 men joined David in this worship parade of sorts to bring the ark of the covenant back to Jerusalem. And as David and the Israel army are transporting the ark, I want you to notice the festive scene, right? The spiritual enthusiasm in the air. This is like a revival sort of an occasion that's happening here. Right? Continuing on in verse 3, it says, They set the ark of God on a new cart and brought it from the house of Abinadab, which was on the hill. Uzzah and Ahio, sons of Abinadab, were guiding the new cart with the ark of God on it. And Ahio was walking in front of it. David and all Israel were celebrating with all their might before the Lord, with castanets, harps, lyres, timbrels, sistrums, and cymbals. Right, so not only is David celebrating before the Lord, the whole house of Israel is following suit. 
I mean, this looks like it's going to be one of the most glorious days in all of Israel's history. This is like a V-Day parade. Right? Shout out and thank you to those veterans among us. Right? This is like a V-Day parade. They've defeated the Philistines. They're bringing the ark back into Jerusalem. It's like a V-Day parade. But then not too far into the journey, this V-Day parade comes to a screeching halt. Look at verse 6. When they came to the threshing floor of Nacon, Uzzah reached out and took hold of the ark of God because the oxen stumbled. Here it is, verse 7. The Lord's anger burned against Uzzah because of his irreverent act. Therefore, God struck him down, and he died there beside the ark of God. Now, how many of you feel like you got whiplash right there? Right, going from a worship service to a memorial service. Right, how many of you feel like Uzzah just got the short end of the stick? Right, being struck down dead simply for trying to keep the ark from falling off the cart. Right? Doesn't it seem like Uzzah should have been thanked instead of thwacked? Right? I mean, all he's doing is trying to keep the ark from falling off the cart. As I said, this is one of the most confusing stories in all of Scripture. This is not one of those stories that pastors love to get up and preach, but you've heard me say this before. We're not going to avoid the hard stuff in the Bible. It's God's Word. But I will say, this is a confusing story. Doesn't seem fair. Doesn't seem to make sense. Everyone was very sincere in what they were doing. And they were doing it for God. And yet, their efforts to honor God only incur the wrath of God. I mean, David is dancing and singing before the Lord with all his might. He's leading God's people to do the same. Isn't this the kind of worship that God is looking for? Well, the answer to that question is not necessarily. Not necessarily. And as I'm going to try to explain to you over the next couple of weeks, I'm going to show you why not necessarily is the answer to, isn't this the kind of worship that God is looking for? Look at how passionate they are. Look at how sincere they are. See, as David is about to find out, true worship is not just characterized by sincerity. True worship is characterized by obedience. Specifically, obedience to God's word. And this worship parade was not marked by obedience to God's word. In fact, there was something going on in this worship parade that was in direct opposition to God's word. See, it might seem like an unimportant detail in the story, but the narrator is very intentional to repeat that the method David used to transport the Ark of the Covenant was a new cart. Right? Verse 3 says, they set the Ark of God on a new cart. And then the end of verse 3, it says, Uzzah and Ahio were guiding the new cart with the Ark of God on it. Again, as I said at first glance, this detail about using a new cart, that doesn't seem that significant. Especially if you read this story in isolation from the rest of Israel's story. But if you back up a few pages to 1 Samuel 6, there's another story about this Ark of the Covenant being moved. Only in this story, it's the Philistines who are transporting it. It's God's enemies, the enemies of Israel who are transporting it. And I want you to notice the transportation method that the Philistines used. 1 Samuel 6, verse 7 says, Now then, get a new cart ready. Verse 8 says, Take the ark of the Lord and put it on the cart. In other words, when David decides to use a new cart to bring the ark of the covenant back into Jerusalem, he's following in the footsteps of the Philistines. Or to put a finer point on it, he's following in the footsteps of the pagan Philistines. Now, to be fair... From a utilitarian, pragmatic standpoint, there are a lot of reasons why David probably chose a new cart as his mode of transporting the ark. Right? A cart was fast. A cart was easy. A cart was convenient. A cart allowed animals instead of people to do the heavy pulling of the cargo. And probably most significantly, the people of Israel, they had already seen the Philistines transport the ark this way. So why reinvent the wheel? Right? Like, well, that seemed to work. Let's just go with that. Why not just use a new car to transport the ark? Well, here's why, friends. Because throughout the scriptures, God explicitly describes how the ark of the covenant was and was not to be transported. And as I'm going to show you over the next few minutes, David's real offense was not that he didn't dance before the Lord sincerely enough. It wasn't that he didn't dance before the Lord passionately enough. Sometimes this 
scripture I've heard get preached that way. That's not David's real offense. David's real offense, as I'm going to show you, was his ignorance about what God's word said about not touching the ark. See, God had warned Israel in no uncertain terms about what would happen if anyone, for any reason, touched the holy furniture of the tabernacle, which was the meeting place with God back in the Old Testament. He warned them what would happen if they touched the holy furniture of the tabernacle, which included the ark. Numbers chapter 4, verse 15, says so clearly, they must not touch the holy things, or they will, say it with me, die. They must not touch the holy things, or they will die. Pretty straightforward, right? I mean, not a lot of confusion about what God is saying here. God says, if you touch the ark, you're going to die. This is to illustrate my holiness. This is to illustrate my transcendence, my being above all. Right? If you touch the ark, you're going to die. Now, the question that naturally arises at this point, maybe some of you are already going there, is, okay, but how was David supposed to transport the ark if he wasn't allowed to touch the ark? Well, haven't you seen Raiders of the Lost Ark? Right? That, that's how. That's actually pretty close to the mark. Right? Steven Spielberg, himself Jewish, he did his homework on that film, going back to Exodus 25 to find out just how God prescribed transporting the ark without touching the ark. Right? I want you to listen to a few verses from Exodus chapter 25, beginning in verse uh, 12. It reads this way, cast four gold rings for it and fasten them to its four feet with two rings on one side and two rings on the other. Then make poles of acacia wood and overlay them with gold. Insert the poles into the rings on the side of the ark to carry it. And so you see how this is supposed to work. By using poles and rings like God's word prescribed, there was a way to transport the ark without touching the ark. And here's the point, as king, it was David's job to know that. See, David, you know, as king, it wasn't just his job to be the commander-in-chief. It wasn't just his job to be in charge of the military. As king in God's people, as king over God's people, it was also his job to know and follow the word in order to make sure that the people under his leadership knew and followed the word. And it was David's failure on this point that cost Uzzah his life. By the way, this is the same principle behind pastors and parents knowing the word of God and making sure that those under their spiritual supervision know the word of God as well. It's why we do child dedications because as parents, we need God's help to know his word so that we can share that truth promises and the commandments of God with our children. Same is true for pastors. This is why the scriptures are very clear. You should be very careful before you step into a teaching role among God's people. Right? There's a responsibility. There's a burden. There's a privilege, but there's a burden because it's upon you to know and study and understand God's word so that you can then share that with God's people so that they can experience the life that comes from knowing and being under the authority of God's word. David's failure to know what God's word said on this subject of transporting the ark, it cost one of his men his life. And this tragedy could have been avoided if David had simply studied the word on this subject before charging ahead with what he sincerely believed was a good thing to do. Now my guess is that most of you know that sincerity has now become one of the, if not the virtue of virtues in our society, right? Sincerity is one of the virtue of virtues in our culture, which is what makes it so difficult to call out certain sins these days, particularly if those sins are of a sexual, relational, or political nature, because so many of the sins in those categories are so sincerely believed to be good. Of course, just because I sincerely believe something doesn't mean I can't be sincerely and even dangerously wrong, right? See, no matter how sincerely held a belief is by an individual or by an entire society, if that belief does not align with God's word, it will eventually lead to death. 
And I know some of you are like, well, that's like an Old Testament story. Like, what are we doing in 2 Samuel 6? Like, the New Testament. Like, some people have this idea that the Old Testament is like, like junior high God before he like grew up and went off to college and got educated and like, I'm serious. And the New Testament Jesus is like, well, that's like the fully evolved God. Well, that's an Old Testament story. Yeah, like I understand you mess up sin, that leads to death, but not the New Testament, right? Folks, Romans 6.23, right? This is, this is in the New Testament, right? Romans 6.23 says, the wages of sin is death. And sin, let's not overcomplicate it. That's just a religious word. It means to go our way instead of God's way, which we've all done, right? So let's just leave pretense and posing at the door. We've all sinned. We've all gone our own way instead of God's way. And the New Testament says the wages of sin is death. Reaching out and touching stuff, doing stuff we weren't supposed to do, that leads to death. Not just in 2 Samuel 6, but in the New Testament as well. In other words, the cost, the consequence of our sin before a holy and just God is death. No matter how sincerely we believe that our way is good. And this parade, friends, is an example of that. This parade is an illustration of that. This parade seemed good, but it wasn't because the way they were transporting the ark did not align with what God prescribed in his word. See, David sincerely believed that what he was doing was right, but he was sincerely wrong. Folks, sincerity is no substitute for knowing and obeying God's word. Ignorance is not bliss. Just ask Uzzah, right? And that wasn't meant to be a snarky comment. Like, a lot of people just think, ah, as long as I'm sincere, ignorance is bliss. No, ignorance is not bliss, right? The fact is, sometimes ignorance leads to death. And not just a physical death, but a spiritual death. Right? This is what God tells his people throughout the prophets over and over and over again in the Old Testament. For example, and maybe most succinctly, in Hosea, Hosea chapter 4, verse 6, God says, My people perish for a lack of knowledge. My people perish for a lack of knowledge. And not because the end goal of the spiritual life is knowledge. Right? Paul talks about how knowledge can puff up and lead to pride. So it's not as though knowledge is the end game of the spiritual life. But because knowing the word of God is so essential to knowing how to love God, then we need to know God's word so that we can know how to love God. Because loving God, as I said a couple of months ago, that is the end game of the spiritual journey. Jesus said the most important command is to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. Loving God is the end goal. But how are you going to love God if you don't know who God is or what God wants or what his ways are? I mean, David was sincerely trying to love God, right? I mean, he was bringing the ark back into Jerusalem out of love and devotion for God. But because he didn't know what God's word said about how to do it, David sabotaged his own efforts at trying to love God. Because, friends, it's impossible to love God if you don't take the time to find out what God wants. And by the way, this principle is true on a human level as well. Uh, you can't love another human being very well if you don't take the time to find out how that person receives love. How many of you uh, know about the book, The Five Love Languages by Gary Chapman? How many of you read that or you've maybe taken a test online, The Five Love Languages? Well, in that book, Chapman outlines five different ways that people give and receive love. Words of encouragement, quality time, gifts, physical touch, acts of service, right? Five different love languages. And Chapman's conviction is that couples' relationships are so much better when they figure out the primary love language of their spouse, when they find out the primary way their spouse receives love. And I agree. I've seen marriages significantly help just because one or both people in the marriage start, quote unquote, speaking the primary love language of his or her spouse. Let me personalize this point. Uh, before I was married, my limited knowledge of women, my limited knowledge of the opposite sex led me to believe that doing the dishes or cleaning the house or doing some other act of service was the best way to show love. And for some women, it is. I even see a couple of women right now nodding. They're smiling. They're thinking, exactly. But I married Amanda, right? And it didn't take long for me to discover that acts of service is last on her list 
of love language languages, right? Behind words of encouragement, behind quality time, behind gifts, behind physical touch. In fact, for Amanda, there's a sixth love language that's even above acts of service, and that is ice cream, right? <laughs> now, let me be clear on this point. It's not that Amanda doesn't appreciate it when I do the dishes, but the smile on her face, the joy in her voice is a little different when we go out for or I pick up ice cream. <laughs> See, over the years, I've learned that if I want to show Amanda the love the way she wants to be loved, an acts of service is a nice, sincere gesture, but going out for or picking up ice cream is a better way to love her. And all I had to do to discover this was take the time to read the signs. Are you with me? All I had to do to discover that was take the time to read the signs. They were all there, expressed in her words and written on her face. Now again, let me be clear, love certainly runs deeper than ice cream. Not much deeper, but a little deeper than ice cream. <laughs> so I want you to get the principle though. In order to love someone, you have to take the time to know that someone to find out how they receive love. Same thing is true in our relationship with God. If I really want to know how to love God, I need to take the time to read the signs. And they're all there written in his word. In fact, three times in John 14, Jesus specifically tells us how we can love him. John chapter 14, verse 15, Jesus says, If you love me, keep my commands. Six verses later, in verse 21, Jesus says, Whoever has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. And then a couple verses later, so three times in eight verses, Jesus says, Anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. In other words, the primary way that we love Jesus is by obeying Jesus. By obeying Jesus. See, God has a lot of love languages. Praising him in song, serving the poor, spending time with him in prayer, giving him thanks. Right? These are all ways that God receives our love. But God's primary love language, God's primary love language, according to Jesus, is our obedience. And by the way, that simple insight about God revolutionized the way I approach reading the Bible. So that no longer is my time in the Word primarily about you know, me doing my spiritual exercises. It's not primarily about getting an inspirational thought for the day. No, reading the Bible is this means of better knowing who God is and what He's looking for so that I can more completely love Him the way He wants to be loved. Conversely, if I neglect reading God's Word then over time, I will short-circuit my ability to love God because I'll be ignorant of how God wants to be loved. And then what happens, uh, if this is you know, something that I'm talking about now more generically, more generally among God's people, what happens is we settle into this religion of sincerity. Right? This is what's happening among so many Christians today who sincerely believe that following their heart is good. Right? The heart being the 21st century version of a new cart. Right? And then these sincere, heart-following Christians are shocked when their lives and the lives of those under their care blow up. Right? I see this all the time. And there's this shock and confusion and then discouragement and then flirting with despair because there's this like, I was sincerely following God. And sometimes you can follow God and life gets hard. Don't hear me saying that. I'm not a prosperity gospel peddler. What I'm talking about is sincerely believing that you're doing what God wants because you're following your heart, even though your heart is not lining up with what God's word says. And then when things blow up, you're like, what happened? And then the people under your care also pay dearly. Some of you know exactly what I'm talking about. Because you've either been a victim of someone over you who went off the rails, or you yourself went off the rails and people underneath you were affected. My guess is that everyone in this room could put ourselves in both camps because we've all done it and we've all been victimized by it because it's a principle, because that is who God is, that is what his word says, and he doesn't deviate. The consequences flow right out of it. That's what happens with this religion of sincerity. That's where it leads. It leads to self-destruction. It leads to death. No matter how sincere, 
no matter how sincere. Folks, there is no substitute for obedience. And sincerity is certainly no substitute for obedience. Right? And there's no way to obey God if you don't take the time to know God through his word. See, David didn't take the time to find out that there was a specific way that God wanted the ark transported. And his ignorance on this matter cost Uzzah his life. Now, I want you to notice how David reacted to God's judgment of Uzzah because my guess is his reaction was like probably most of us would have reacted. Look at verse 8 back in the story. Then David, this is right after Uzzah's died. Verse 8, then David was angry because the Lord's wrath had broken out against Uzzah. And to this day, that place is called Paris Uzzah. Verse 9, David was afraid of the Lord that day and said, how can the ark of the Lord ever come to me? He was not willing to take the ark of the Lord to be with him in the city of David. Instead, he took it to the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite. Again, David basically responded like some of us when we've sincerely tried to follow God and things don't work out the way we'd hoped. David becomes angry. David becomes afraid. David becomes frustrated. So much so that he actually abandons the mission of bringing the ark of the covenant back into Jerusalem leaving it at this guy Obed-Edom's house for three months. Right? Listen to verse 11. The ark of the Lord remained in the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite, for three months. And the Lord blessed Obed-Edom and his entire household. Now, this is where the story gets really interesting. Because only after David discovers that the Lord has started blessing the socks off of Obed-Edom, does he realize that maybe the problem with that worship parade was with him, not with God, and not with the ark. Now, what David does next in the story gets condensed here in 2 Samuel 6 to simply say, David went to bring up the ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom. But in the more detailed 1 Chronicles account of this story, we get a clearer picture, a fuller picture of what happened before David went back to Obed-Edom's house. So this is what it says in 1 Chronicles chapter 15. Then David summoned Zadok and Abiathar the priest. These are the spiritual leaders. David's like, you know what? I'm going to get some direction from people who know God's word. So he calls up Zadok and Abiathar the priests. And then he says this to them. So somewhere along the way, he's figured something out. He says to them, you are the heads of the living families. You and your fellow Levites are to consecrate yourselves and bring up the ark of the Lord, the God of Israel, to the place I have prepared for it. Here it is. It was because you, the Levites, did not bring it up the first time that the Lord our God broke out in anger against us. We did not inquire of him about how to do it in the prescribed way. Do you hear David's confession here? At some point during those three months of frustration, at some point during those three months of confusion, David went back to God's word and discovered the error of his ways. That God had a specific way that he wanted the Ark of the Covenant to be transported. And then once he found out what God's word said about how to transport the Ark, he confessed where he had been wrong. He admitted where he needed to make a course correction, and he repented. He turned back to God and his ways. Right Now, it took him three months to get there. Right, It took him three months to get there because sometimes our pride keeps us from humbling ourselves enough to admit that we've gotten off course. Sometimes our pride keeps us from humbling ourselves and admitting that we need to course correct. Right? In fact, the following story about a U.S. naval ship and a Canadian authority off the coast of Newfoundland is one of my favorite course-correcting stories. I'm pretty sure it's an urban legend, but it's such a great illustration of how pride can often block us from admitting when we've gotten off course. So the story is uh, of a radio transcript, and it begins with a U.S. Navy commander stating, please divert your course 15 degrees north to avoid a collision, to which the Canadian authority responds, Recommend you divert your course 15 degrees south to avoid collision. To which the U.S. Navy commander responds, This is the captain of a U.S. Navy ship. I again say, divert your course. To which the Canadian authority says, This is but a second-class seaman. However, I say again, divert your course. To which the U.S. Navy commander says, This is the aircraft carrier USS Abraham Lincoln, the second largest ship in the United States Atlantic Fleet. We are accompanied by three destroyers, three cruisers, and numerous support vessels. I demand that you change your course 
15 degrees north. That's one five degrees north, one five degrees north, or countermeasures will be taken to ensure the safety of this ship. To which the Canadian authority says, this is a lighthouse, but it's your call. When David realizes what the word said about transporting the ark, he swallowed his pride, admitted where he had been wrong, and made the necessary course corrections. And as a result of his repentance, as a result of his turning back to God and his word, he was, as we're going to see next week, blessed and a blessing. He was blessed and he became a blessing. See, friends, in David, we see here a foreshadow of the gospel. A foreshadow of the gospel. The good news that through repentance and faith, we can be saved from death and brought into a path that leads to life. Brought into a path that leads to life. Now, I know this story is one that's marked by death. But please hear this point, friends. Even Uzzah's death underscores one of the important truths of the gospel, that God does not wink at sin. He's not like you and me. He doesn't rationalize. He doesn't grade on a curve. He does not wink at sin. God judges sin because he's just. He's good. He's God. He's God. And the wages of sin, God says in Romans 6, 23, is death. Folks, do you think God's judgment against Uzzah is extreme? But it's really a picture of the consequences of a just God judging our sin, which is why every single one of us would be up a crick without a paddle if it weren't for Jesus. If it weren't for Jesus, who willingly took the consequences for our sin upon himself so that God's justice would be upheld and our sins could be forgiven. That's what God is doing at the cross. He's doing both of those things. His justice is upheld because he is a just God. And he's making a way for our sins to be forgiven. Folks, we have all reached out and touched things we weren't supposed to touch. Done things we weren't supposed to do. Sometimes sincerely believing that what we were doing was good and sometimes knowingly doing things that we know we weren't supposed to do. Right? We've all, every single one of us is Uzzah. Every single one of us has reached out and tuck, touched things that we weren't supposed to touch. Sometimes knowingly and sometimes sincerely believing that what we were doing was good. We were following our hearts. Even though that thing was not good. Was that all of alignment with God's word? Right? Such that in either case, the wages of sin, going our own way instead of God's way, is death. But thank God for the gospel of Jesus through whom all our sins can be forgiven when we turn to and trust him to be our savior from sin and the Lord of our life. See, that's the good news for those of us, which is all of us who have wandered off course. Through Christ, we can now humble ourselves and come back to God and receive both forgiveness for our failings in the past and his help to course correct in the future. And thank God that through his word, we can now also learn to walk in his ways. Such that when we mess up, we can now freely go back to his word. We're now covered in Christ's righteousness. We don't have to hide. We don't have to pretend to be better than we are anymore. When we mess up, we can go back to his word and we can make whatever necessary course corrections we need to make. So that we can live that life that brings glory to God and great good to us. Right? As I showed you last week, folks, this book is our source of life. It's our source of wisdom. It's our source of guidance. It's our source of joy and hope and strength and encouragement. And yes, it's also our source of correction when we go off course, which we do, which I do, which you do, we do. We go off course. And so this book is also our source of correction. That's actually one of the words that's used in that scripture we looked at last week where Paul says all scripture, all scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness 
so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. As I shared with you last week, this book is our vision. This book is our game plan for life. This book is our game plan for life, which is one of the reasons we're rolling out in 2022 what we're calling NT260. If you were here last week, you heard me talk about this. NT260 is a very simple game plan for reading through the New Testament in a year. Basically, it involves reading one chapter a day, Monday through Friday for 52 weeks, because five chapters a week times 52 weeks equals 260, which is the number of chapters in the New Testament. And the average time it takes to read one chapter of the New Testament is just five minutes, maybe a few four, more minutes if you're in Luke chapter one or you know, some of those chapters that are longer. But on average, it's going to take you about one, about five minutes to read one chapter of the New Testament. I want you to just think about that, especially those of you who are like, I've never read through the New Testament, which I know is a bunch of us, right? Five minutes a day, five days a week for 52 weeks, and you will read through the entire New Testament. And my hope, my prayer is that all of us would take this step of signing up for NT260. Right, that's the first step I just want to lay out before you this morning in response to this story. Right, ignorance is not bliss. Sometimes sincerity will lead to death. And the story takes a turn when David goes back to the Word. That's why this first step that I want all of us to take is to sign up for NT260. Now, for those of you who don't have a Bible or who have the kind of Bible I had as a new believer that I could barely understand, Perhaps an additional next step for you to take this morning is to pick up a study Bible, a free study Bible in the lobby that's yours if you commit to being a part of NT260. I don't want anyone to walk out of here feeling like, I want to take this step, but I've got this King James Bible at home. No offense to those of you who like to read the King James Bible. More power to you. Right? But you're like, I don't even know how to read this. These and thous and thys and... Right? I don't want you to let that be a stumbling block to getting into God's Word. So we've got, we've got some study Bibles out there. I think we ran out in the first service. I don't know if we, we may not have any study Bibles. Put your name on a list, and I promise you, we will get you a study Bible. I was looking at some of them. I, maybe they're all gone. They're fantastic. They'll help you. There's commentary notes, and there's ways to, like, it's, it's going to help you get into the Word. So don't let that be a stumbling block. Now, for those of you who have already established a daily pattern of reading God's Word, well, perhaps for you, your next step, if we end up needing more NT260 leaders, is to be one of our NT260 small group co-leaders for our in-person, Zoom, or texting groups. Like I said, we may not need more co-leaders, but if you would be willing to serve in that capacity, if we do, then I would encourage you to check the box and let us know that you'd be willing to serve in that role. And then finally, for some of you, your next step today is to acknowledge that you, like all of us, have reached out and touched things you shouldn't have touched. Done things you weren't supposed to do. Sometimes knowingly and sometimes sincerely believing that what you were doing was good. Even though according to God's word, it wasn't. As I said, the wages of sin, going our own way instead of God's way, the wages of our sins is death. But thank God for the gospel of Jesus through whom all our sins can be forgiven when we turn to and trust him to be our savior from sin and the Lord of our life. Maybe that's your next step today. See, the good news for those of us who have wandered off course, which is all of us, is that through Christ we can now humble ourselves. We can now come back to God and receive both forgiveness for our failings in the past and his help to course correct for the future. Maybe that's your next step today, to turn to and trust in him as Savior and Lord of your life. Next Sunday, we're going to look at the rest of this story in 2 Samuel 6, and we're going to see what happens after David get, gets back into God's word and goes back to the course that God outlined for the transportation of the Ark of the Covenant. You're going to see how David becomes both blessed and a blessing. So I hope you come back next week for that. But this morning, I want to wrap up our time by reiterating what I said at the end of Vision Sunday last week, that this, folks, is our vision. That this, folks, 
is our game plan for life. God's word, right? Because this book contains everything we need to live a life that will bring glory to God and good to us, including getting us back on track on those occasions when we go off course, which we do all the time. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for what you've done for us in Christ. Thank you that you did not wait for us to get our act together, but you initiated relationship with us through Christ. While we were still sinners, you came for us, died for us in Christ, even as we were singing about earlier this morning. Hallelujah. Thank you for what you've done for us. We do. We pray that you would just make that truth rooted in our hearts so that we would know that you love us, that you do not wink at sin, but you love us. Lord, we just want to confess those places where we're ignorant, where we have trusted in our own hearts, where we've sincerely gone our own way, even though it doesn't align with your ways. We acknowledge that your ways are higher than our ways. And I would pray, Lord, for our church family, that we would become a people grounded in your word, that we would take the time to get into your word so that we wouldn't be perishing for a lack of spiritual knowledge so that we and the people under our spiritual supervision would be blessed, would experience the life that you have for them. So Lord, do that work that only you can do by your spirit. Lord, help us as a church to get into your word. And then Lord, help get your word into us so that we might live out of it for your glory and for our good. In Jesus' name and all God's people said, Amen. Would you stand as we close out our